Welcome to the first video of the Role of the Board Treasurer three-part video series. My name is Kelly, and I'm with the Community Development Unit of Alberta Culture. The goal of this video series is to introduce the role of the treasurer on a nonprofit board. Some of you may not be board members, which is fine, but we want you to be aware that the information and concepts presented in this video series are from a board member perspective and are at an introductory level. This video focuses on the information you need to know if you are a first time nonprofit board treasurer or are looking for a refresher on the subject. Please note that the information presented in these video recordings and the related materials are not intended to constitute legal advice, the rendering of legal concepts, consulting, or other professional services of any kind. We simply want to share with you information that we think will be helpful as you navigate your organization through its operations. We are not lawyers, chartered accountants, or other kinds of financial professionals. So for your own organization specific situations or questions related to the material that we present, you may need to seek advice from a professional in the related area. We also have a toolkit with links to other resources related to the role of the board treasurer that you may find helpful. We developed a glossary that you can refer to during the videos and the glossary and toolkit are both in the description of the YouTube videos as well as the online courses on the Alberta Nonprofit Learning Center. By the end of this role of the board treasurer three-part video series, you will be able to identify the financial responsibilities of the board and treasurer, explain the treasurer's role in managing and overseeing financial transactions of the organization, describe the treasurer's role in financial procedures and financial reporting, explain the treasurer's role in financial strategy and risk management of the organization, identify how the treasurer serves as a member of the board's executive team, and describe how to support the board treasurer in performing their role. By the end of part one of this role of board treasurer, video series, you will be able to identify the financial responsibilities of the board and treasurer and explain the treasurer's role in managing and overseeing financial transactions of the organization. So let's get started on the role of the board treasurer video part one. You may ask yourself, why does a nonprofit need a board treasurer or what qualities and skills are required for the position? In order to understand the role of the treasurer in a nonprofit, it is a good idea to first look at the big picture and how the treasurer fits into the overall financial responsibilities of a nonprofit board. The left circle represents the board, and as you can see, the treasurer is a member of the board. One of the fundamental collective roles of the board is stewardship of the organization's resources. The board has a fiduciary duty and is responsible for governing and overseeing the organization's affairs within the framework of applicable laws and standards. This includes financial governance, or making sure the organization operates in a fiscally responsible manner. The board must be satisfied that the financial information is in order, which includes ensuring that proper accounting structures and processes are in place, and that financial reporting is completed. Individual board members must also understand these structures, processes, and financial reporting. It is important to point out that the basic responsibilities or functions of the board treasurer are closely linked to these financial governance responsibilities of the board. And this is because the treasurer is also a board member. If we look at the circle on the right, we can see that another key responsibility of the board is to ensure that the financial management function within the organization is carried out. And the board may choose to delegate authority for financial management functions to others. Depending on the size and structure of the organization, 
The board may choose to delegate some or all of the financial management functions to the treasurer, the finance committee, the executive director, other staff or volunteers, etc. This delegation may be through the organization's bylaws, board policies, committee terms of reference, job descriptions, etc. In doing the research for this video series, we found that roughly 50% of boards have written job descriptions for their treasurers. This is because a board must decide what it expects of its treasurer, and a written job description is an effective way for a board to identify and communicate its expectations to the person carrying out that role. A written job description also makes tasks more manageable. This is because it can help with clearly defining and evenly distributing tasks that can help reduce treasurer burnout. The job description can also set out what the role is expected to do and how it relates to the other roles on the board and in the organization. This helps to limit duplication and confusion. It can be used to evaluate the current board treasurer's performance and recognize achievement. A job description can also make it easier for boards to recruit new board treasurers when the time comes. Prospective treasurers are more likely to be interested in serving in the position if the role is clearly defined. And lastly, job descriptions can also be used to orient a new board treasurer. Now let's look at the overall financial responsibilities of the board. Generally speaking, in addition to its primary function to oversee the organization, the financial roles and responsibilities of a board fall under two primary categories, resource acquisition and financial stewardship. Let's start with the first main category, resource acquisition. Resource acquisition in this context means the resources that are required to achieve the mission of the organization. In other words, it is the board's responsibility to ensure that the nonprofit has sufficient resources to achieve its mission and mandate. Resource acquisition can also mean creating the most appropriate revenue and funding model for the organization. In other words, the board will determine how and where the organization will get its funding. For example, through grants or donations or other, depending on your organization. It also involves ensuring there are appropriately skilled and appropriately designed systems. The board is responsible for ensuring there are skilled and qualified people and good financial structures in place to maximize the efficiency and effectiveness of the fundraising activities. The second main category for the board's overall financial responsibilities is financial stewardship. This includes ensuring the budget is aligned with strategy or mission of the nonprofit. Ensuring that financial risks to the organization are identified and managed. Ensuring there are appropriately skilled people and appropriately designed systems to steward the organization's assets and protect them. Ensuring the board has financial governance skills and understanding to fulfill its appropriate roles. For example, Individual board members need to have an understanding of financial statements and budget documents. Financial stewardship also means ensuring that the board is receiving all of the financial information it needs and in the appropriate and consumable format that allows the board to evaluate and make appropriate financial decisions. Last but not least, is ensuring that the organization is in compliance with its regulatory environment. For example, its incorporation legislation, Canada Revenue Agency regulations, employment standards, if it has paid staff, and other sorts of things. Please remember, as I mentioned earlier, although the board can delegate specific tasks to the treasurer or others, board members members cannot delegate their oversight responsibilities or their overall accountability 
and they should ensure all of these responsibilities listed on the slide are carried out. Individual board members must assume responsibility for the overall financial governance and financial health of the organization. They cannot just offload all of this responsibility to the treasurer and or the finance committee, for example. The treasurer is responsible for overseeing the financial matters of the organization in line with good practice and in accordance with the governance documents and legal requirements. The treasurer reports to the board of directors regularly to inform them about the financial health of the organization. Now let's look at the main functions and duties of a treasurer. The main functions and duties of a treasurer are to manage and or oversee the organization's financial transactions, ensure proper financial procedures and financial reporting. This includes ensuring there are appropriate financial structures and procedures in place and that financial reporting is completed. In other words, the treasurer will ensure that the organization's financial statements and reports are prepared and all of its tax filings submitted. Advise the board on financial strategy and risk. This includes ensuring that the annual budget is prepared and may also include advising the board on fundraising as well as financial risks. And serve as a member of the board executive team. We're going to explore each of these categories in more detail as we go through this video series. In this video, we explore the first category, which is manage and or oversee the organization's financial transactions. So let's get started. One of the four key functions of a board treasurer is to manage and or oversee the organization's financial transactions. A financial transaction is an agreement or communication carried out between a buyer and a seller to exchange an asset or service for payment. Here are some examples of financial transactions in a nonprofit organization that a board treasurer should ensure are carried out or processed. Some of the most common examples include payments to vendors. This can include payments to contractors or suppliers for insurance, supplies, utilities, and other services, etc. Another example is processing donation monies that are received, staff payroll, membership or registration fees, ticket sales, and so on. Payment of payroll taxes. If your nonprofit has paid staff, there will be payroll taxes that need to be remitted to government. Deposits to bank, um, or credit cards and other similar organizations. Remember, this is not an exhaustive list, so there are other examples as well. Managing and or overseeing the organization's financial transactions in general includes three overall tasks to perform and or ensure are being done. Receiving and banking monies collected. Paying the organization's employees and vendors. And keeping records in respect of the organization's actual financial transactions. Here we are referring to recording or monitoring individual entries into organization bank accounts, capital accounts, cash flow accounts, monitoring account ledgers, etc. Ensuring there is a record of each of these transactions and that they align with organization priorities and board directions. Just want to point out here that I am not referring to keeping records of transactions as part of the overall bookkeeping or the development of financial statements that board treasurers are also responsible for. I will speak about that in some upcoming material. In this section, we are only speaking about keeping records of actual individual financial entries or transactions. 
We are going to explore this from the standpoint of what you need to know when you first become a board treasurer of an organization. To manage and oversee the organization's financial transactions, you need to know three things. Awareness of all bylaws, policies, and procedures that are related to financial transactions of the organization. Become knowledgeable of all current, recent past, and upcoming board or organization financial transactions and related financial documents. Know the structures and procedures related to making payment and receiving money on all board and organizational financial transactions. And we're going to dive deeper into each of these areas. One of the first things you need to do is review and become familiar with all organization bylaws, policies, and procedures that govern the carrying out of financial transactions of the organization. For example, there might be a board policy related to control of expenditures, which might include such things as who can authorize spending, upper limits before approval is needed, and who in the organization can sign checks or authorize online banking transactions, segregation of duties, etc. If you are unclear about any of them, seek clarity from the board or the senior staff person. The second thing to do is become knowledgeable of all current, recent past, and upcoming board or organization financial transactions and related financial documents. Some of the examples in this category are looking for the documents related to payments for services that were provided or received, documents for payroll, membership fees, donations, fundraising, insurance policy payments, payments to instructors or contractors or coaches, facility rentals, payments on lines of credit or mortgage, and other types of things. What is a good way to do this? Well, look for transactions on the payments and receiving of funds in the documents of the organization's financial transactions. For example, cash flow, bookkeeping, banking, and re accounting related documents, etc. Also, research financial related items in the recent minutes of board meetings. This will provide information related to current financial decisions and transactions. The nature of your organization will dictate what type of financial transactions take place in an organization. A good place to start for the treasurer is to find out what the various financial transactions look like in your organization. That's the first step in managing and overseeing the organization's financial transactions. The third one is to become familiar with how the organization makes payments and receives money, essentially identifying structures and procedures or financial transactions. You need to find out the policies and procedures related to making payments and receiving money. Some of the examples here are, does your organization do e-transfers and or credit card, check or cash payments? How are they done? and what security processes are in place for those. What about notification of payment processes such as invoices, bills, emails, and the like? How does your organization do these? What are the policies and procedures related to making payment and receiving monies on all tra organizational transactions? The next one is to become familiar with bank transaction procedures, including depositing and withdrawing funds, as well as reconciling bank statements. And the last one is to ensure you see alignment with the financial transactions that are carried out and the decisions of the board, through motions, policies, procedures, strategic plan, etc., throughout your term as treasurer. These three areas are all fundamental functions of the board treasurer in managing the organization's financial transactions in any nonprofit. But how the functions are performed by a treasurer may be different depending on the size and complexity of the organization. 
in a smaller nonprofit. As treasurer, you will likely be responsible for carrying out the majority, if not all, of the financial transactions yourself, and often even doing the bookkeeping. So have the former treasurer go over recent, current, and upcoming or future transactions of the organization. If that person is unavailable, then you could perhaps ask the uh, board chair to assist. You should also ask the former treasurer whether the organization has any undocumented outstanding payments or income that you should be aware of. For example, perhaps the organization's van broke down this past week and the transmission needs to be repaired. It's at the garage for repairs and the invoice, which is probably a large one, hasn't been sent to the nonprofit for payment yet. This is the kind of item that could fall through the cracks during a transition between the outgoing and incoming treasurers. This scenario also begs the question, who authorized the van going to the garage for repairs? Is the treasurer aware? And is there enough money in the organization's bank account to pay for a large bill at this time? This just underscores the need for the treasurer to be in the know and proper financial authorization processes to be in place. The next thing is to create a timeline or electronic calendar documenting due dates for bills and other upcoming payments. And throughout your term as treasurer, always ensure you see alignment with the transactions that need to be carried out and the directions of the board through motions, policies, procedures, strategic plan, et cetera. For instance, if we are a basketball team and we have a motion from the board to purchase 50 basketballs, and you as a treasurer see an invoice for the purchase of 50 baseballs, you need to ask some questions. And the last one is ensure that the treasurer authorization information is carried out according to the organization's procedures. Here is a typical example of a transfer process for a new treasurer taking over from the former one, but ensure that you follow your own organization transfer procedures. Get all the bank account records and details. Get the bank forms that are required to update signature cards and online account access as soon as possible. You also need to transfer credit card authorizations and have all checkbooks and credit cards that were in the possession of the former treasurer turned over to you. So what does managing and or overseeing financial transactions in a larger organization mean for the board treasurer? In many cases, in a larger organization, as treasurer, you will be overseeing or monitoring the financial transactions and associated bookkeeping or accounting that is done by others who have been assigned these specific tasks. For example, the bookkeeper, accountant, financial officer, executive director, etc. To start, you need to develop a good working relationship with all parties that are doing the actual transactions and bookkeeping for the organization. Have them go over recent past, current, and future transactions of the organization with you when you first meet, and then regularly throughout the year. Although you may not be directly performing and documenting transactions, you need to know why, when, and how they are being done and being documented as if you were carrying them out yourself. Again, this is part of a good working relationship that is imperative that you develop with your bookkeeper, accountant, financial officer, and or executive director, depending on who's responsible. If the executive director or other staff person is paying organization bills, make sure you review the bank statements and bank accounts. Make sure you understand all the entries made by the bookkeeper. If something doesn't make sense to you, ask questions. Typically, the ED or bookkeeper will be able to provide a good explanation. And, you know, this is all part of developing a good relationship with those key people and providing oversight as the board treasurer in a larger organization. Next, you need to ensure everyone is clear on who does what, 
and how each carries out their responsibilities. Job descriptions that include details of financial responsibilities are a must, including for yourself as board treasurer. Look for duplication, gaps, areas where communication needs to be tightened up, further financial transaction information required, and any changes to job descriptions that are needed, etc. And once again, always ensure you see alignment between the transactions being carried out and the directions of the board through motions, policies, procedures, strategic plan, etc. throughout your term as treasurer. If you don't see alignment, find out why and inform the board of the issue. Also check to see if signature cards and other bank-related information needs to be changed as a result of you becoming the treasurer. This may not be necessary to the degree that smaller organizations require because there are staff, such as bookkeepers, accountants, etc., in place performing organization financial transaction functions on a day-to-day -day basis, but it is a good thing to confirm. In summary, whether you are a large or small nonprofit or somewhere in between, the board has a responsibility to ensure the financial management of the organization. Remember the points made earlier in this video. You as the treasurer are the point person for the board to ensure that responsibility is being carried out following and aligning with board direction. Whether you are doing much of the financial transaction legwork yourself, or if you are monitoring and ensuring that work is being carried out by others. Because e-transfers have emerged as such a popular and common way for payments to be made between two or more parties, both in our personal transactions and with nonprofit groups, we want to share some information that may be helpful to you. Electronic funds transfer, also known as e-transfers or EFTs, through a third party is now the number one method of payment for businesses in Canada. Payments by checks and cash are declining. You might ask why? Well, because e-transfers are convenient, cost-effective, safer, and are much more efficient to process. But you do need to keep some considerations in mind. Although it is commonly accepted, a recent poll showed that there are still many Canadians who ranked e-transfers behind debit, cash, and credit cards as being most trusted. So even if you feel e-transfers are perfectly safe, your participants, members, clients, or other stakeholders may not feel the same way. Therefore, any payment method for transactions needs to be taken with due consideration of your organization and its stakeholders. From a security perspective, e-transfers need to fall in line with accepted online banking practices, and this slide includes some tips. When you are using online payments, it is important to have multi-factor authentication, or MFA, in place and other security features, such as installing a quality firewall, antivirus and spyware programs, and ensuring that your web browser is up to date. Review who has banking access regularly, including changing passwords every one to two months, and ask the bank for text or email alerts for significant changes in account balances. Disable automatic password save features in browsers, apps, and software. Never do banking on public or unsecured Wi-Fi because it is a risk. Log out of online banking windows after you finish your work, keep receipts of online banking transactions, ensure internal controls are rewritten with the online banking environment in mind, including e-transfer processes, and ensure they are maintained. For example, verify that your nonprofit has updated its internal controls and financial policies to reflect the fact that it is now using online banking. Some nonprofits make the switch to online banking, but fail to update their financial policies and internal financial controls to reflect this. 
Perhaps your organization had a check writing policy that stipulated two board signatures on all checks. In an online banking environment, this policy would need to be updated. And one more thing about banks or other financial institutions. Be sure to shop around. Many financial institutions offer special banking plans for community groups and nonprofits. For example, many banks and credit unions recognize that community groups and nonprofits are different from regular businesses, and therefore, they may offer banking plans that are flexible and cost effective. These benefits may include reduced monthly fees, overdraft protection, fee rebates, and bill payment customization for your nonprofit. For example, fee rebates with minimum monthly deposits. Become familiar with your financial institution and banking plan and ensure you're getting the best deal available. It is worthwhile to shop around. This brings us to the end of the first video in the overall Role of the Board Treasurer three-part video series. Thank you for watching. Our contact information is on the slide and is in the toolkit as well. If you are in Alberta and have a question, need further information, or would like to request our services, you can contact us by email or phone. Lastly, if you would like to be notified of our future services and resources, you can add your email address to our subscription form and you will receive updates as they become available. The link to the subscription form is in the description of the video as well. Thank you for your attention. Take care and always remember that our communities have so much more because of everything you do. Thank you and we'll see you in the next video.